Okay, we've just had the uh, February session of the Legal Advocacy Club. And at tonight's session, uh, the members have been performing the plea and mitigation. So I'm just going to share some feedback and some tips in relation to performing this piece of advocacy. So um, a question I'm often asked about the plea and mitigation is what's the typical structure or in what order should I deal with points? Um, and, and the thing about the plea mitigation is it's one of those, each advocate has their own style with this. And even on a personal level, I find from one plea mitigation to another, I might vary the order in which I deal with um, certain points. And, and you'll, you'll find that in time, it's one of those pieces of advocacy that you modify and you deal with differently on a case-by-case -case basis. So in terms of some of the typical points that you'd want to be covering within um, a plea mitigation, um, very early on, you would want to deal with credit. So, of course, if your client has pleaded guilty, you want to address uh, credit. Of course, if they pleaded at the earliest opportunity, you'd be asking for the maximum level of credit. Um, if they've pleaded fairly late in proceedings, you may want to address why that is, um, if it's important in relation to the case. Um, of course, you need to be dealing with the sentencing guidelines as well, because most offences tend to have specific guidelines that apply to them. Um, so you'd be wanting to deal with those and where your case falls within the guidelines, so the appropriate categorization. Uh, you also want to address any uh, aggravating and mitigating features uh, and which of those apply to your case. Um, if there are, of course, any aggravating features, you want to um, address those and see um, any ways that you can effectively take the sting out, um, as it were. Um, and then lastly, you want to be dealing with personal mitigation as well. And of course, that may well come back to the offence or could, uh, deal with um, any appropriate um, sentencing options for the court. So they're the things that you want to be dealing with, with uh, within your submissions. Um, but of course, there's no set rule as to the order in which you want to deal with them. Um, sometimes you might find that there's judicial intervention within a plea and mitigation. It doesn't always happen. But sometimes it might because a judge might have a specific concern um, in relation to the sentencing exercise. There might be something that concerns them about the facts of the case. There might be something about the history of the case uh, that the judge is concerned with. If that is the case and you're asked a question, deal with that point because that is what the judge is concerned with. Don't say, I'm going to continue with my submissions and get back to that. The judge is asking, deal with that point. Um, because that, uh, that is obviously something that the judge sees as very important when it comes to the sentencing exercise. Um, dealing with categorization of an offence, you need to be fairly sensible. So don't be pitching this in a category that's way below one that's commensurate with the offence. So taking this example here, this was obviously a, a disqualified driving case and um, all the features were present that would indicate that both culpability and harm were high. And in this fictional scenario, the prosecution had pitched this as an A1 offence, i.e. top bracket. Um, you haven't really got much room to argue against that. What you really need to be doing in a case like this is be sensible, accept the bracket in which it falls, um, and then try and mitigate and bring it down within that bracket. Um, it might be the case that you've got a, 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 an offence whereby there has been a guilty plea and your client is showing genuine remorse. You need to express that to the court. And I think that this fictional scenario is certainly one of those and put that across. And that is um, quite a significant point when it comes to mitigation. So really try and put that across within your submissions. Um, and as part of that, you may even want to explain why it is that the offence has occurred. So in this you know, particular scenario, the defendant has um, a reason, not a great reason, but a reason nonetheless as to why it is that he's committed these offences we put that across to the court, that goes hand in hand with the remorse that he's shown as evidenced by his guilty plea. So once again, all comes back to, to the element um, of remorse. And then lastly, you need to look at the instructions from your client and look at what his key focus is. Um, and of course, in this case, um, the key thing for him is he needs to stay out of prison. You know, he needs um, either, uh, you know, community order or at the very least, um, any custodial sentence would need to be suspended and ha keep that in the back of your mind when you're making these submissions so that you're urging the court not to impose um, an immediate custodial sentence and really ask the court to find any alternative that it can. 
Um, coming back to um, coming back to general presentation tips, and it's the same things that I'll talk about all the time. But of course, the nice uh, slow pace is very very important. Um, you know, the judge is going to be taking notes. I think the use of the pause can be utilized very well when it comes to the plea and mitigation as well. So when you're addressing maybe uh, the reason why an immediate custodial sentence might not be appropriate, if you've made a significant point in that regard, just pause, let that hang there, let the judge really think about that for a good few seconds before moving on to your next point. So the use of the pause can be really important um, and really uh, impactful in a piece of advocacy such as the plea and mitigation. And then, of course, eye contact is key. I mean, of course, it might be that you've met your client just before, moments before this hearing, you've taken notes, uh, and then you're having to go straight into court. Um, but, of course, you know, you want to have it such that, you know, you've got your notes there, but for the most part, you glance down and then back up and then look at the judge um, as much as you can or the magistrates. So you've got that eye contact. It feels like you've got, the, or well, not feels like you will have, um, an element of rapport with either the bench of magistrates or the judge. Um, and having that eye contact just helps you feel a lot more conversational and therefore hopefully persuasive. So uh, I hope that those um, uh, tips have been helpful.